You know, Ralph, Leroy Collins told me when he first came down to Miami before his television program, and he went out on the street to shake hands with people, and he'd say, I'm Leroy Collins. And they'd say, well, uh, what do you want? Who are you? But he said after the program, everybody knew him, and he said that uh, this program, together with the other programs he had on television, helped elect him governor of the state of Florida. Well, it shows that uh, people who were desiring to get into public office and those already there uh, began to depend more and more upon television as a means of communicating with the public. For example, uh, in this photograph, uh, we had a distinguished triumvirate uh, visit uh, the studio, uh, Senator George Smathers, our current president, Lyndon Johnson, and Senator uh, Stuart Symington. We've had a good parade of, of names and celebrities and important political personages visit our studio through the years. Yes, they recognize the value of television exposure quite well. Well, we're in the year 1954. Let's keep going. We also installed a new 1,000-foot tower in Hallandale. It was the highest structure in Florida. This was the first 1,000-foot tower ever constructed in Florida. We were quite concerned, as were our engineers, about building a tower of that size, which is as tall as the 150-mile hurricane winds that uh, we have in this area. Now, at this moment, you're uh, giving the instructions, and we switch over to the new tower, Monday, May 17, 1954. And everybody could see the dramatic difference in their pictures. Our signal went out uh, a further distance. Instead of just covering a very short area, we then went out to where we cover from perhaps Fort Pierce all the way down the Keys, over to Fort Myers, and also to uh, Nassau. There was another show in those days, the Lee Dickens Show. This young lady believed excitement made a good program. Here's an excerpt from one of her weekly shows. She walked the wings of a high-flying airplane. She even climbed one time our 1,000-foot tower and went snake hunting. But how's this for thrills? In May 1955, our film cameras were installed in a rented room in a downtown hotel. Working with Miami Crime Commission director Dan Sullivan, we installed a one-way mirror in an adjoining room occupied by an undercover man posing as a bookie. The hotel management had no idea what was afoot. Two Miami policemen made a call on the undercover bookie. What you will see next is part of the on-the-air newscast, May 9, 1955, as we kinescoped it at that time. The pictures are the main evidence in the case. And now watch. First, Sergeant King and Detective E.J. Carberry enter Bookie Ben's room. We pick up the film as Sergeant King is seated on a chair, talking with Moskovitz, who's seated on a bed. The two men converse. Detective Carberry walks by the mirror, partially obscuring the picture. As we pick up the scene, King continues the conversation. At this meeting, King allegedly makes arrangements to have a bag man collect $50 a week protection money from Moscovitz. King arises, shakes Bucky Ben's hand as he prepares to leave. And the most dramatic part of the tale, sound motion pictures of the actual payoff by Bucky Ben to Bagman Monroe. The microphone has been hidden in a telephone. The two men speak in hushed tones. Much of the sound is thus muffled, but you can gather what does happen during the transaction. Watch and listen. Thank you. 
The two policemen and the cab driver who accepted the alleged payoff were arrested and brought to trial. Through a technicality, they were not convicted. The policemen were fired. An appeal for reinstatement was turned down by the state Supreme Court. Bumper to bumper, that's what the traffic was called in Dade County back in 1955 and 56, and that is what we called a four-part documentary on the problem of Dade traffic. We were growing fast, but our highways were not keeping pace. This series of four programs was cited as a major influence on the building of new highways throughout the country. I think, Ralph, that's absolutely so. I think that these series of programs did more to create the absolute demand by Dade County citizens that we have the uh, expressway system put into effect. Then came 1957, September the 2nd, and WTBJ became the first television station in the nation to regularly broadcast a daily continuing editorial. Ralph, speaking for management, I think that's the proudest thing we have done since we've had WTVJ. We were the first television station in the United States to daily editorialize and broadcast these editorials. And we did it at a time when the Federal Communication Commission, our bosses, had not decided that it was the proper thing to do. Since then, they've not only decided it's the proper thing to do, but they encourage broadcasters to uh, editorialize daily. And I think we've been able to accomplish a lot of good for our community with your daily editorials. Came late 1957, and we'd all been jolted alive by the Russian Sputnik. All eyes at that time were turned to Cape Canaveral when we tried to put up our first satellites into orbit. WTVJ cameras were there, recording the successes and the failures such as this one. You know, Ralph, coverage such as this not only by our station, but by all stations in the country, I think uh, gave the American public the incentive needed to not only meet, but I hope surpass the Russians in space and the benefits that will eventually come from this program. Our sports cameras just a few weeks later recorded this dramatic death of Ezio Selva, the Italian boat racer, as he flipped at the Orange Bowl regatta. Nineteen fifty-nine, Miami is riddled with strip joints. We assigned an undercover reporter to appear at the airport as a tourist looking for some action. Equipped with a hidden mic and a tape recorder, he had the cabbie lead him to a strip of dives and clip joints in the heart of Miami. We called the two documentaries we subsequently produced Honky Tonk One and Two, and they appeared to be the main reason Miami subsequently outlawed such establishments. 